Um, the early settlers had no way to get their product to market. There were no railroads, the trails were impassable many times of the year. It took two weeks by ox cart or longer to get to the nearest market in Dubuque or Muscatine. So the Cedar River soon became, first by flatboat and later by steamboat, the method of transportation, the interstate of the 1800s, if you will, to get products to market. But the pioneers, actually, the main ford was down near Pennykin Ford Plant, or down near uh, that, uh, in that area where there was a, a rock bottom to the river. The rapids, it was down the, near Ninth or Twelfth Ninth and Twelfth Avenue is where the pioneers crossed the river. I remember he was older than my dad yet. His name was Ike Kaczorowski. You spell that. I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> and he had himself a camp just across the river over here on the on the flats there. And uh, you'd see him with his big John boat fashioned uh, around his shoulders. And uh, he'd be out there on the shallow water feeling around uh, the, the bottom to, to get these clamps. And I was told prior to that, there were families of clamors that set up down here uh, in Riverside Park. Mm -hmm. And uh, right there where the sewer discharges, uh, you know, with the runoff sewer. Yeah. I'd probably haul it down probably to Guttenberg or even uh, Davenport where they had button factories down there that ground the buttons out of the, out of the shell. Ooh. My name is John Zyasball. I'm uh, part owner of Five Seasons Bait and Tackle. We've been here 16 years in business, same place, on, down on the southwest side, right along the river there. So John, every day you have people that come into your bait shop, uh, local fishermen who are closest to the river. What kind of concerns do they raise to you? I think there's a lot of people that uh, are concerned with the pollution issue. Uh, whether it be from factory or farm runoff up above, I think there's a lot of lot of worry about that. I have some people that say that they would never touch a fish out of the Cedar River and eat it, and I got other guys that some people feel comfortable with that, and they've been eating fish out of there for 20 years, and quote unquote, they haven't died yet, so they're okay with that. <laughs> Recently, local educators have taken the initiative to teach local youth the vital nature of our water resources. We're here at Prairie High School with uh, Sharon Bender, uh, who was the 2003 uh, Classroom of the Year through the Iowa Water Program. Sharon, uh, we just have a few questions to ask uh, you and uh, to kind of learn a little bit about your class and the reactions that you've had with uh, water quality issues and the uh, river systems in this area as a whole. First question is kind of how your class was started and the foundations of it and how you uh, began teaching uh, water resource issues. Uh, here at Prairie High School I started teaching water quality monitoring in the fall of 1999 in my ecology class. I was wanting my students to have a hands-on experience doing science in the field. Uh, over the summer I had taken a workshop on water quality monitoring uh, through Iowa Water and the Iowa DNR. And I was very excited after I took that workshop. I learned techniques to use with my students and I wanted to try them out. And I started doing that fall uh, with my students and they were connected with the science education standards. Uh, my students were able to provide information that was valuable to the community and they were able to learn to do cooperative work together, and it worked very well. And what I try to convey to the students is that what happens in those areas is going to go downstream, and it's going to affect the people who live downstream, and those eventually will affect people all over the world. It's ended Prairie Creek. Well, I think it's absolutely imperative that our students learn how important water is to us 97.5% of our water is in salt water, 
Uh, Two percent of our water is in ice caps, and we only have 0.5 percent of our water that they can use. And they need to learn to respect the water. They need to learn to care for the water. And uh, if I don't do that with them, I think our future is in problems. As we float, the beautiful afternoon turns to evening. We land our canoe on an island and pitch camp. Uh, we have kind of an inferiority complex in Iowa that there isn't much natural beauty here that you have to go to Colorado or Vermont or someplace to find beauty, and that's not true. There's a lot of beauty here. Uh, we just need to discover it. And in many cases, we can help coax that beauty back when we can restore wildflowers or we can restore a prairie or we can restore river otters or grass pickerel. Uh, it's just a little more diversity which is a little more color and a little more beauty and a little more interest and a little more reason for us to connect with, with this earth that sustains us. Though our garbage accumulates and litters the shore, the cedar's beauty is still evident. The river means different things to us all. For some, it's a source of recreation. For some of us, a place for contemplation. For all of us, it should be an inspiration. As we continue to cross over its bridges, let us agree on its importance to our community's character, culture, and continued health. No longer can we act complacent in our responsibility to our freshwater source. Change your life, maybe change your mind.